getting to giving. I invite you to hear these sacred words, and if you would, please stand for our lesson from the gospel. As he came out of the temple, that is Jesus, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, the kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Praise God for the hearing of these sacred words. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And as we do start, let us pause for a moment of prayer. Lord, on this day, we do ask that you would grant us the grace, the strength to be present to you, even as you're here present with us. God, I ask that you would take the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts. And again, we ask that you would move in such a way that they would be acceptable in your sight. For indeed, you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. Stewardship. When we hear the word stewardship, immediately we think about money and we think about institutions. And certainly part of stewardship involves both of those, money and institutions. But here's the thing. Stewardship is so much more than just our finances. Stewardship really is about all the gifts that we've been given. It's about seeking to use everything that God has given us in such a way that it's reflective of the love of God. That's really what stewardship is. The image that comes to my mind is the little worksheet that you were given on your way into worship today. This is our little stewardship slash service ruler. You see, stewardship and service are intimately connected with one another because if we're going to serve, that means we're going to share our gifts with other people. And if you look at the service ruler, you'll notice that it's organized around what growth looks like. It starts from exploring all the way to maturing at the top. And then at the bottom of the sheet, it says that it's grounded in God's grace. You see the words prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying grace. Now, the word grace is a churchy word. I'll admit it. But here's what we're talking about really when we're talking about grace. We're talking about the stirring of God's presence within our lives. That's what grace is. Grace is when God doesn't necessarily give us what we want, but really what happens is God gives us what we need. And what do we need? We need grace in the sense, we need a sense of God's presence within our lives. And this worksheet really does paint a picture about what that looks like and how that works. In the middle, we see the stages of how God's grace stirs within us. It starts with the longing for a sense of purpose. We begin to ask questions like, why am I here? How does my life fit into a bigger story? What am I to do with myself? These are, this is just but the beginning, really, of that initial stirring of God's presence. Next, if you move over one block, you'll see that often what happens next is we start to experiment with service. Maybe we sign up for a, a one-time kind of volunteer opportunity. Maybe we decide to go on a, a mission trip, but we begin to experiment with service. And if we keep going down that path, what happens is we begin to identify what our real gifts and passions are. That's kind of like the middle stage. We start to serve more regularly, and we start to discover our gifts. And from there, as we hone in even farther, we begin to learn more about how we can use those gifts in some more effective ways. But if you look at the very end, though, the maturing stage, what we begin to see is that service is not really just a one-time type of thing. Instead, it's a commitment, really, to orient and orienting everything we have, all of our gifts, 
according to God's presence, according to God's love, according to God's kingdom, or another way to say that is according to God's reign. When we're using our gifts in the way that God has intended us, basically what happens is it leads to our flourishing as institutions, as communities, as people. It leads to our flourishing. And when we fail to do that, when we fail to use our gifts in that way, what does it lead to? But our own, well, destruction. Things begin to fall apart. Which leads me to our lesson for today. The story about Jesus' prediction of the fall of the temple. Now, if you're like me, when you first heard that lesson, you thought to yourself, what does that have to do with stewardship? And I promise you, it has something to do with stewardship. And so we're going to have to go on a journey together to see how that all works out. Let me just kind of give you the story behind the story, though. Just before our lesson today, Jesus has spent some time warning his disciples. He says to the disciples, hey, you have to be careful. Be careful with people who like to walk around with fancy robes, who like to pray sophisticated prayers, who want the best seats in, this, in places of worship or the marketplaces. They talk a good, faithful talk, Jesus says, but really, behind the scenes, they trample on the poor, they trample on the widows, they trample on people's lives. Be careful with these people, Jesus says. And the next scene, right before our lesson then, after he warns his disciples, it says that they go to the temple. And as they're at the temple, what happens is Jesus sees, and it's a famous story, he sees a, a poor widow go to the temple treasury and drop everything she has into the treasury, two copper coins. I have a picture of what those coins may have looked like. This is a, a picture of an old copper Roman coin that very well could have been the type of coin that this lady uses in the Gospels. It's so small, we had to blow it up, but you can kind of see what it would have looked like. And there's another side to it, too. Um, that's likely the Caesar of Rome on that coin. Very small, very insignificant, worth a fraction of a cent. And when Jesus sees the widow do that, of course, he celebrates her. He says, she put everything she had into the treasury. She, she gave it her all. Well, all this happens right before our lesson today. And as we begin to read our lesson, what do we see? But Jesus and the disciples are walking out of that temple after he had just said these things to the disciples. And what do the disciples do? Well, they miss the point. Because that's what the disciples do again and again in the Gospels. They miss the point. And specifically, how do they miss the point? Well, they begin to like comment on how wonderful, how good, how magnificent the temple the building, how much it is, like just wonderful it is. And you can see a picture of what that temple may have looked like. It's, well, it's an extraordinary building. The first century uh, historian Josephus said it was one of the wonders of the world. They, call it, they called it Herod's temple. And they started building it like 20 years before Jesus was even born. When Jesus walked the earth, they were still working on it. Some of the stones in Herod's temple were like 12 feet by 40 feet long huge. It would have gold, it had gold on it. It was magnificent. You can imagine what these fishermen from Galilee thought when they saw this temple. They were in awe of it. In any case, the disciples were like, wow. And what does Jesus say? The whole thing is going to be destroyed. The whole thing is going to be torn apart. And then in the very next scene, what happens? Well, the disciples do what any of us would have done. They pull Jesus aside and they say, When's this going to happen? And it's then that Jesus kind of lays out the signs, the beginning of the end of the temple. He says, first, it's going to be that people start following after false messiahs, people who claim the name of Christ, but they're really not about Christ. They're false messiahs. Next, he says there's going to be conflict because people are falling after these false messiahs. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And finally, he says there's going to be earthquakes and there's going to be famine. And then he ends on a hopeful note. He says, this is but the beginning of the end, or you could say it another way, it's the beginning of something new that God is getting ready to do. And so it's all pretty straightforward, right? They come out of the temple, the disciples miss the point, Jesus says it's going to be destroyed, they didn't ask Jesus when it's going to happen, he gives them the signs to look for, and then he ends with the word of hope. Pretty straightforward on one level. 
But on another level, here's the thing about this lesson today. This is not just a prediction about the destruction of the temple long ago. This is a story about us. This is a story about what happens when we fail to cooperate with God's presence in our lives. Things begin to fall apart. Temples begin to crumble. Institutions do not make it. You see, in the New Testament, we are the temple. If you look in the New Testament and you notice the passages, the, the fascinating thing about the New Testament writers is they say that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, don't take my word for it. Take Paul's word for it, for example. He asked this question once. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? We belong to God. And another lesson in Hebrews chapter 9, the author of Hebrews is using language from the temple here. He writes, Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, I know it's a little bit hard to decipher that type of language. What's the author saying here? He's basically saying that in Christ's sacrifice, God has removed whatever it is that we think separates us from God. That's basically what it's saying. And what the author is also basically saying in this passage is through faith in Christ, we become vessels of the holy. We're it. An extension of God's presence in the world. And finally, there's, of course, Jesus. In Matthew chapter 12, he says this, something greater than the temple is here. Jesus is talking about himself here, his own ministry, his own mission in the world. But here's the catch. He shares that authority with us. He commissions us as Christ's followers to be echoes of God's presence in the world. And when we cooperate with that presence, we flourish. And when we don't cooperate with that presence, what happens? Well, our communities, our institutions, they begin to perish. They begin to deconstruct. And, and what are the signs, though, of us not cooperating? As we think about it, just go back to the words of Jesus. What were the signs Jesus gave us? to indicate that we were not cooperating. The first thing we do when we're not cooperating is, well, we follow after false messiahs. We follow after false leaders. And as Christians, who is our leader? As Christians, who do we follow? Are you sure about that? <laughs> we follow after Christ. That's who we follow. And when we don't follow after Christ, what happens? Stage two. There's wars. There's rumors of wars. There's conflict. We're not following after Christ's ways. And when we're not following after Christ's ways, what happens? Well, it says there's the stage three version is there's earthquakes. I know it's a little bit hard to figure out what to do with the earthquake portion of it, but as I thought about it, it, is, it does make practical sense. You see, in the, in the ancient world, when it talked about earthquakes, plagues, droughts, anything like that, I believe that's the ancient world's way of saying, when we're not cooperating with God's presence, then we're not cooperating with creation itself either. I have no way of proving that there were actual earthquakes. I have no way of proving there were actual plagues. I have no way of proving that Jonah was swallowed by the whale. I have no way of proving any of that stuff. But that's not the point, folks. What the ancients are trying to tell us is that when we aren't cooperating, we are in conflict with creation itself because we're in conflict with the creator. And when we're in conflict with the creator and creation itself, what's going to happen? Life is going to deconstruct. And so really, I mean, circling back around now, this lesson is an invitation for us to get back to the basics. And what are the basics? Number one, center in Christ. That's who we are. It's what we're about as a Christian people. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the word of God made flesh. He's everything we can understand about God in human form. We put Christ at the center. Number two, what do we do? Well, instead of wars and rumors of wars, we seek to build bridges. We build community. Just a few weeks ago, I was talking to a friend of mine. They said, what's the greatest challenge facing the church? I thought for a moment, and I said, you know, 
the greatest challenge for the church is pretty much always the same. It's, it's how do we create pockets of community beyond Sunday morning where people are known, heard, and reminded of Christ's presence. That's the biggest challenge again and again. And I'm really excited to, to talk about some of the little pockets of community we're creating even now. I mean, we're, we're starting a cancer support group right now. Uh, the, some of the members that are joining the church today have created their own small groups lately. There's some wonderful things going on when it comes to small groups within the life of our church. And the final thing, instead of earthquakes, instead of fighting creation, what do we do? We serve. We serve. We serve the world. We serve the people of the world. We seek to be agents of healing in all of creation. A story that I think puts us all together real quick. This past Friday, I was asked to uh, pray at a banquet for the University of Evansville. One of my side gigs is I'm the part-time chaplain at the University of Evansville. And the, the banquet was for, it was called the, it's called the 1854 Society, which is basically a fancy term for this is a big banquet where they try to raise money for the future of the university. That's what it is. And I'll be honest with you, it's not my jam. I mean, if you know me, I'm like a hillbilly in disguise. And so I'm at this banquet, not my jam. And uh, they asked me to pray. And the second thing, if you know anything about me, well, I'm a pastor. And here's the catch. When you give a pastor a microphone and tell them to pray, you're always going to get a lot more than just a prayer. And, well, I didn't fall short. I had a few words to say. Here's what I learned going into the 1854 society, though. 1854 is a big year for the university because that's the year it started, 1854. And so I got curious, and I thought, well, who started it all? And what I learned was it was a person by the name of John Moore. John Collins Moore was his name. And so I got even more curious, and so I started Googling, and I found his obituary online. It was a wonderful testimony of faith. Just a snippet of his life. Moore was born in 1810 in Maryland. His family traveled what was then west of Cincinnati and planted there. In 1841, Moore joined a Methodist church, and it wasn't long after that he came to faith in Christ. Fast forward to 1854, Moore and his church decided that they wanted to plant a college. And so in 1854, they opened a college. They called it Moore's Hill College. And not only that, what's interesting about that college is this. When it opened, it was the fifth, edu fifth institution of higher education to co-educate both men and women. Like 60 or 70 years before women could even vote in this country, they were co-educating men and women. Why? Number one, it was because of their faith. Faith in Christ. Number two is because they, they believed in the sacred potential of every person. Number three, they, they believed it was their call, their mission to share their gifts with other people. You see, that's what stewardship really looks like. It starts with putting Christ at the center of our lives. It continues with trying to create community with one another, connection with one another. And then we go into the world together to, to serve. And when we do that, Folks, we can have a huge impact. Think about Moore, John Moore and these Methodists in 1854. What they started way back then has had an impact 150, 160, 170 years down the road. And when I look at us today, I think to myself, who knows what God could do with us if we take what little God has given us and we decide to share that in such a way that it could have, make an impact in our community. In just a few moments, you're going to be invited to, to make your financial pledge for the upcoming year. During the final song, I'm going to invite you to come forward and just lay it in the baptistry as a sign of, really, as a sign of us saying yes to God's calling upon our life. Before we do that, though, we're going to receive some members into the life of the church. And I'm going to invite them to come up in just a few minutes. And uh, they're going to stand right up here and we'll introduce them. You don't have to come yet, members, but I'm going to invite you in just a second. Let me just say one more quick thing about stewardship and our pledge, though. I get that making a financial pledge is a stretch for people of my generation. 
I'm just going to be honest. I know. I get it. We hesitate to put our name on the line. We're not all that passionate about becoming an official member of an organization. I know. But here's the catch, folks. If you think about it, each and every moment of each and every day, well, at least every week, we're going to make a pledge somewhere. We're going to subscribe to something online. We're going to become a member of a Facebook group. We're going to pledge that we're going to pay for our mortgage and car. These are all necessary aspects of our life, but the truth of the matter is we're always making pledges. The difference here, though, is this. When we make a pledge to the church, what we're saying is, I'm going to take the gifts I've been given. I'm going to invest them in Christ because I believe ultimately that's what will last. And friends, when we do that together, we can have an impact on our community and our world. Maybe you're not even at a point where you could say, this is how much money I'm going to give the upcoming year. Certainly that's okay. But I challenge you to consider it. Just put your name on the line and say, well, I'm going to pledge to be committed to the ministries of this church in the upcoming year. We can make a tremendous difference when we do that. And so it is, in just a few moments, I'll invite you to come and make that pledge in the baptistry. But before we do, I'm going to invite our new members to come forward and We'll gather here around the front of the church, and I will introduce them um, to you, the congregation. So come on down now, new members.